Welcome. Welcome to Perimeter Institute. Welcome to Perimeter's public lecture series. And welcome to this, the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the Director of Educational Outreach here at Perimeter. And it is a pleasure to welcome everyone here, both those of you here in the theater and those of you watching online. Now, this past week was an incredibly exciting week here at Perimeter. And in fact, it was a pretty exciting week all around the world of science. On April 10th, the first image of a black hole was released by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. It was a consortium of researchers from Perimeter Institute and a dozen international partner organizations. The image reveals a black hole at the heart of M87 galaxy, it's 55 million light years away. The black hole is incredibly massive and compact object, so intense that not even light can escape. EHT researcher Avery Broderick, who holds the Delaney family John Archibald Wheeler chair here at Perimeter, was part of the announcement in Washington, D.C., while other researchers and staff gathered in the bistro to watch the announcement online. Congratulations to Avery and to the hundreds of researchers involved in the project. We look forward to even more exciting news from the EHT in years to come. So congratulations to the EHT consortium. And let's thank you. Now our lecture, our lecture will last approximately one hour and it will be followed by a question and answer session. For those of you watching online, Dr. Damien Pope and a team of PI researchers are behind their keyboards ready to engage in conversation. Use hashtag PI Live to join that conversation. And also if you have questions to send in at the end, uh, use the Twitter feed and I'll try to get them asked to our presenter as well. And now, tonight's speaker goes to the very beginning of Perimeter, the very beginning. Lee Smolin joined Perimeter Institute in 2001 as a founding faculty member and remains a senior faculty member today. His contributions include work on, quant on quantum theory of gravity, to which he has been a co-inventor co or major contributor on two significant directions, loop quantum gravity or deformed special relativity. He also contributes to cosmology, to quantum field theory, the foundations of quantum mechanics, theoretical biology, philosophy of science, and economics. Born in New York City, Dr. Smolin attended Hampshire College and Harvard University. After postdocs at IAS Princeton, ITP Santa Barbara, and the University of Chicago, he held faculty positions at Yale, Syracuse, and Penn State University. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a member of the Royal Society of Canada and the recipient of numerous, numerous awards and recognitions. Dr. Smolin is the author of more than 150 scientific papers, as well as the author of five books and co-author of a sixth and numerous essays for the general public. His most recent book, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution, The Search for What Lies Beyond the Quantum, was just released last week. Tonight, Lee will share with us his vision for the future of quantum physics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Smolin. Thank you. Okay. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Perimeter Institute and Greg and everybody for the invitation to start the set of talks and presentations connected with this new book. But, and this is my favorite audience, it's great to be here. It's great to have watched the public lectures evolved from the first one, which was Roger Penrose, when three times as many people came as we had seats in the auditorium at the university. I don't know if any of them were the same people here. And we just had Roger here two weeks ago, which was a, a, great, a great honor and a great pleasure to have Roger Penrose here. And tonight I want to talk about an issue which I'm very concerned about and which Roger is very concerned about and which some physicists are so concerned about that they devote their lives and their careers to answering. And that's the problem with quantum mechanics. Now, you've all heard, and I, I'm talking to lay people, if there are some colleagues here and some professionals, then this talk is not for you. And if you have your own approach to quantum mechanics, you don't get to stand up and say, but my approach is blah, blah, blah. Because 
I'm here at the moment. You can, you can be here <laughs> later. I've, as Greg mentioned, I've written six books, and there's a common theme of all of them. They're all about philosophical, which just means difficult, problems and questions that are arising in contemporary research in physics and cosmology. And I write the books in order to think about the questions that the books are about. Now, the question about quantum mechanics, about making sense of quantum mechanics, is the question in physics I've been thinking about the longest, in fact. Although I don't, I don't work in it in the formal sense of publish papers and go to conferences and so forth, as much as I would have liked to, perhaps, and as much as I've worked in other areas. And that's another story we may get to for the end. I called the book Einstein's Unfinished Revolution. Well, let me first say I wanted to write a book about quantum foundations as I wrote the series of books. I started with the question of particle physics and where the numbers which characterize the elementary particles come from, and I went through a series of fundamental questions. And I'm very glad to finally come to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was, for Einstein, the great conundrum. Einstein, in 1905, as many of you will know, wrote four scientific papers which revolutionized physics. And he revolutionized physics twice. There were two revolutions in 1905, the relativity revolution, which he initiated in 1905 with special relativity, which means relativity not in the presence of gravity. And relativity developed to 1915 when he produced general relativity, which is the full theory of space and time, including an explanation and a characterization of gravity. And it's a triumph of that theory that we're celebrating with the discovery of the black hole horizon. That's not what I'm talking about today. Einstein also published a paper about light in which he introduced the very puzzling idea that light is both a wave and a particle. And that initiated more than any one paper, the quantum revolution in 1905. And that developed slowly. Many people contributed and quantum mechanics was put in its final form in 1927. Now, why do I say that the revolution is incomplete? First of all, because there were two revolutions which were initiated, but they were all part of one, all part of a great transition in our understanding of nature from Newtonian physics and things related to it like electrodynamics and the next theory, which has something to do with quantum mechanics and something to do with general relativity and something to do with particle physics and something to do with cosmology, but we don't have yet. And that's the unfinished revolution. The revolution is unfinished because we have to put the two parts together. That is, we need a theory that incorporates quantum mechanics or quantum physics along with space, time, and gravity. And that's sometimes called the task of quantum gravity, and I've devoted enormous time to it. I'm going to embarrass Renata Lowell, who I'm very proud is here, who is one of the great contributors with her own approach. We all have different approaches. And when it comes to quantum gravity, there are a number of approaches, and they've been presented and discussed in this auditorium. And they all do something impressive, and we learn something from each of them, but maybe, Renato, you agree we're not there yet. None of them are the right, exactly the right thing. But that's not what this talk is about. What this talk is about is the other unfinished part of Einstein's double revolution, which is making sense of quantum mechanics. You've all heard of Schrodinger's cat, which is dead and alive and who knows what, and can't you tell from the smell before you open the box? <laughs> And we've heard of particles that are here and there, and waves and particles. And it all doesn't make, it sounds like it doesn't make any sense. And the real story, the point of view that I want to discuss today, is that, in fact, it doesn't make any sense because it's wrong. 
And I'm proud to be standing here where Roger Penrose was just a couple of weeks ago and he said the same thing. Now, some people are polite and we say it's incomplete, but we really mean, and this is Roger chated me for, we, why don't we just say it's wrong? Because that's really what we mean when we say it's incomplete. So that's what I'm talking about tonight. Now, a complete theory should describe, well, first, let's get something straight. These are theories which are incomplete, quantum mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, etc., in the sense that they apply to only parts of the universe. You set up a description of a system, and always think about that. We're discussing the collision of some elementary particles. We're discussing the states of a molecule, the configuration of a molecule. It's always a system which is mentally idealized as being separate from the rest of nature, to which we apply the laws of nature and attempt to understand how they function and predict how they're going to function. A complete description should tell the whole story, and in particular should give us a history of what's happening, where, if it's, we're talking about electrons and protons and neutrons and other particles in an atom, it should tell us where those particles are and how they're moving. And a, a theory that was complete shouldn't depend on our intervention. That's one of my themes. So let me establish at the beginning. I'm interested in understanding nature. I'd, I'd love to understand myself better, but that's hopeless. <laughs> so I don't want a theory of myself intervening with nature or having a conversation about nature. I do science because I want to understand how nature is in our absence, what is really going on? What is the story? Because after all, through most of the history of the universe and the universes before that and before that and before that, we weren't there. So our knowing, believing, thinking, intervening, preparing, measuring shouldn't play a role in what fundamentally the atoms and the elementary particles are doing. So that's what I mean by a complete description. One way that this gets played out in discussions is with the term realism. The philosophy of realism, and as scientists, some of us are realists, and as you'll see in this talk, many of us are not. Those of us who are realists believe that nature exists independently of our knowledge and beliefs about it, and that the properties of systems in nature can be characterized and understood independent of our existence and our manipulations. That's what I mean by a realist. A theory can be called a realist theory if, well, I said it right there, it speaks in terms of properties whose values or whose truth or falsity don't require us to interact with the system. <laughs> When a property is just believed to be a property of an atom or an electron in an atom, we say it's a beable. Now, there are other kinds of theories which explicitly talk about our interaction with the atoms or with the molecules. These are called operational theories, and they deal in properties that are explicitly the responses of the system to a detector or to an intervention. And we call those observables to distinguish them from the beables, that theories that are just about nature and not our, not our intervention are about. So I want you to have clearly in your mind this distinction between a realist theory and an operational theory and a beable, which is something that we believe exists independent of us, an observable, which is something which is a response to our intervention. Now, part of the story of this talk is that several of the key founders of quantum mechanics were not realists. They didn't believe that nature existed independently of our interaction with it. They didn't believe that the atoms that they were developing a theory, remember that's what quantum mechanics was to be, it was to be a theory of radiation, electrons, and atoms, and explain the interaction of those things, and nuclei, and solids, and metals, that 
everything else in nature, but specifically you start off with this theory of radiation and then a theory of atoms. And they didn't believe that these atoms had properties independent of our intervention. And they, they weren't playing. They deeply didn't believe that. And that's another talk by a scholar, which I'm not, to talk about why. But let me just hint what the scholars do talk about is that the generation that made quantum mechanics was the generation that were teenagers during the First World War, the Great War. And they therefore, all their older brothers and cousins and many uncles and fathers went to war and didn't come back. And they were this generation which had nobody above them for 20 or something years. So there was an openness, but they had also just seen the destruction of European civilization and everything that had been built up and all the optimism and hopefulness of the 19th century. So they were deeply scarred, and they were deeply suspicious of rationality, of optimism, of progress. And these are the few, we can, I'm not going to tell the stories about them as individuals, but this is the generation and the mood in which quantum mechanics was invented. Now, the mentor of that generation, there was one older person who was Niels Bohr, who was a Danish physicist. And these are some things that he said, nothing exists until it is measured. When we measure something, we are forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We are not measuring the world, we are creating it. Everything we call real is made up of things that cannot be regarded as real. This is what he believed before he invented quantum mechanics. I, he was very influenced by Kierkegaard, etc. and I'm not going to pretend to be a scholar. We must be clear that when it comes to atoms, language can be used only as in poetry. And I'll stop there. Werner Heisenberg, his protege, who did more than anybody else, he was a protege of he and Max Born simultaneously, which was the great mystic, the great thinker, and the great formal builder of systems, Max Born. And Werner Heisenberg was sort of 23, 24, 25 when the peak years were going on. And he wrote, the atoms or elementary particles themselves are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of things or facts. What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And the natural laws of quantum theory no longer deal with the elementary particles themselves, but with our knowledge of them, the elementary particles. So this was the philosophy that they brought to the construction of this new theory. And not surprisingly, the theory that these anti-realists, which is what the philosopher would call them, there are people who don't, didn't sign on to the philosophy of realism, made the theory they made quantum mechanics. And when I say quantum mechanics, I mean the particular theory that they made and put in final form in 1927 was not consistent with realism. And I'll explain to you why. The properties that, and when I write QM, that means quantum mechanics, uses to describe atoms depend on us to prepare and measure them. They are observables. The theory speaks about observables, quantities created by our intervention, not beables. Now, does this matter? And that's something I want everybody to reflect on, because as is said many different ways in many different venues, this is a hard, weird, puzzling period. And among the things that we're concerned about, some of us anyway are concerned about, is that there seem to be a lot of people out there in the world who are gaining or interested in gaining power, who don't believe in rationality, in evidence, and so forth. And it's very easy, however, 
to go into a political mode and for me to sit in my elevated, what is it, ivory tower and criticize people with different political points of views and agendas. So I'm going to criticize some people with my, who tend to lean the same way I lean, because it's not just the right versus left. These are people connected, this is about 15 years ago, people connected with the philosophy called postmodernism. A simple criteria for science to qualify as postmodern is that it be free from any dependence on the concept of objective truth. Let that sink in. <laughs> they think that's good. By this criteria, for example, the complementarity interpretation of quantum physics due to Niels Bohr and the Copenhagen School is seen as postmodern. So Niels Bohr was a, one of these people who's a great personality, a great mentor, a great teacher. And he was given for his talent and achievements an institute in Copenhagen that we aspire. It was much bigger than our institute here, but if we make 1% of the contribution they make, we'll see Perimeter as a success. And he brought all the great minds of Europe thinking about quantum mechanics, either as students or as postdocs or as visitors to his institute. And the view which I'm attributing to them, which came out of that institute and the people there, we call the Copenhagen view or the Copenhagen interpretation. And again, it would be wonderful if someday there's a Waterloo or a perimeter interpretation of something. But we hope it's the next theory, because this theory we're trying to get. <laughs> and the other one, the other quote is like that, radical critiques of science that seek to escape the constraints of deterministic dialectics. I can't even read this stuff anymore, but this is what I grew up on. <laughs> must blah, 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 blah. Within a dialogically agitated environment, debate about reality becomes in practical terms irrelevant. Reality finally is a historical construct. So maybe it does matter that our basic fundamental scientific theory that everything else builds off of is imbued with really the same philosophy and spirit. At least I worry about that. Now, having expressed opinions for a while, I now have to bring you up to speed and teach you a little bit of quantum mechanics. And this is quantum mechanics as formulated by Heisenberg and Bohr and Max Born and other people of that generation. It's based, I'm gonna mention three basic principles that it's based on. And there's no equations. There's something that looks like an equation, but I'm going to explain it to you. But there's just one. The uncertainty principle. Now, an idea that you can think about is, supposing you have a complete description of some atom or molecule, if it really is complete, it should allow you to predict the future. And there's a list of properties that you would like to know for all the particles in that atom or molecule to predict the future. The position of all the particles, the, where they're going, their trajectories, which cashes out into what we call the momentum, which is the direction of motion. It's an arrow, which is the direction of motion, whose length is proportional to the momentum. And the momentum is basically the mass times the speed and it's what's conserved in a, in a collision. And that's all I'm going to say about it right now. But it's what you need to know to predict the future motion of the particles, is the, where they are and with what momentum and in what direction are they traveling. The uncertainty principle says that's what you need to know tough. You can only have half of it. And that's really what it says. And why it's exactly half, we don't know. That's why it's a principle. So, you know, I always teach this, and somebody, a student, raises her hand, and it's a good question. Explain to me why the principle is true. And I say, that's the point. It's the principle. It's the part everything else can ex be explained, given it. So we don't know why it's half. We don't know why you can choose the half. You can know uh, as much as you like about any half you'd like, and I'm going to make use of that in a little bit. 
An interesting thing about physics is that the properties of particles and really anything else come in pairs. There's position and momentum. There's electric field and magnetic field. And other things that, you, that are more technical. But they always come in pairs, like position and momentum. And at any one time, you can always know one with complete precision, but then the other is completely random. And we say that the, the uncertainty delta x in the position times the uncertainty delta p in the momentum can't be as small as you like when you multiply them together. It has to be greater than a number called h bar. So that's the expression of the uncertainty principle. And this was invented by Werner Heisenberg. The second principle is the superposition principle. It says, it, now, if you give a, a description of that half that you're allowed to know, that's called the quantum state. And the, the superposition principle says, if you have one quantum state, if you have an electron in some quantum state, I'll call it A, and, elect and consider moving it to a different quantum state. This quantum state might be located kind of here, and this quantum state might be located kind of here. Then there's another quantum state that you get by combining them. And it looks like we're kind of adding them, although it's not exactly the way you would think of addition. But don't worry about that. There's another quantum state associated with adding them. Now, this is very familiar if you think about waves on water. Think about throwing a stone into a pond and a wave spreads out. And your friend throws a stone into the pond at almost the same time, and some other waves spread out, and it makes a pattern, which is basically the addition or the superposition of the waves. So waves like to superpose. But in quantum physics, it's general. Any two states can superpose. And that's the second principle. And that's the summary, which just went by. But if somebody <laughs> wants to hear it again, when we get to the questions. Yeah. So those are two of the basic principles. There's a third coming in a little while. And now I have to tell you the key thing, which is how quanta, quantum mechanical things change in time. Newtonian things change in time according to a law that tells you the acceleration of the particles if you know the forces. And there's one law, which is Newton's law, which tells you that. And you apply that to a system of planets or stars, and you compute how they move. Quantum mechanics is better than that. We have two laws. And that's the whole problem. <laughs> because whether you use the first law, which I call rule one, or the second law, which is called rule two, depends on whether the system is being measured or it's not being measured. And being measured is something that we impose on the system. We are making a measurement on the system. Now, most of the universe is unknown to us and is not being measured. So that the first rule applies to. And when we make a system in the laboratory, most of the time, we're just letting it run on its own following its own law and logic. And that's what this applies to. So the first law is rule one. And roughly speaking, I'm not going to write it down mathematically, but it's a wave equation. It's an equation. Remember, Einstein started with the idea that there was this duality between waves and particles. So this is most easily seen or visualized on the wave side. And just like there's a law which governs how water waves propagate on the surface of the lake, there's a law that governs how the quantum state, conceived as something like a wave, propagates and flows. And that I'm just going to call rule one. And it applies when you're not making a measurement. Now, the flowing metaphor is apt. If there are different ways to go, this will, the wave will explore all of them. If you can go around the chair this way, or I'm not supposed to go around the podium this way, but I, I know. <laughs> but my wave would explore going around that way if I were characteristically quantum mechanics. 
So a, a part of the implication of rule one or law one is that the system explores all the alternatives available to it. If, if you're thinking of going from here to that side of the stage, rule one would imagine all the possible ways of getting there. And you would get a flowing picture of a wave going there. But what does that wave mean? And at the moment, I, I'm not telling you. I'm going to tell you. The other rule, the other law, applies only to when we make a measurement. And in the particular case of measurement of position, what it says is the following. Look for the particle somewhere and measure its position, and you will find it somewhere. And where you will find it, I can't tell you explicitly where it is or where you will find it, but I can tell you the probability. Where did that come from? Well, it's introduced here. The law, the first law doesn't speak anything about probabilities, but the second rule or law does speak about probabilities. And roughly speaking, it says the probability to find a particle at a point here is equal to the square of the height of the wave at that same point. That is called Born's rule. And keep that in mind, because we're going to come back and need to talk about that rule. OK. So this second rule says, more generally, that if you measure a system, there are going to be a number of different outcomes which are possible. And it tells you that you will see one of those possible outcomes with a probability related to the wave in, a more, in some more general sense. So that's rule two. OK? Everybody with me? Now, that's why quantum mechanics is not a realist theory. Because in the fundamental laws, in the fact that there are two rules, two laws, and in the distinction between when you apply one and when you apply the other is the concept of measurement, i.e., our intervention on the system. If we weren't around, there would just be rule one, according to this. So this is just a summary, but I think we'll, in the questions, we can come back to the summary. You've got the basic idea. I want to emphasize that this theory, quantum mechanics, has been incredibly successful in even as much as general relativity with the great triumph this week of general relativity. There is no experimental evidence that it's wrong. And yet, my message to you today is that it is wrong. And it's wrong because since the concept of measurement is primary, it's a, theory, it's a theory, as Born Heisenberg said to you in those quotes, not of the atoms and the elementary particles, but of their interaction with our experimental devices. And it doesn't give a complete description of what the, what's really going on in the atom or the molecule or the nuclei that it's describing. So it's not, real, it's not compatible with realism, and in fact, it makes, if you believe that this is the way nature is, then it's very hard to be a realist. So that those people I was quoting who sound like clueless academics have a point. So this is really just saying what I just said. Now, let me emphasize the problem we might be measuring the trajectory of an antiproton produced at the Large Hadron Collider in a big accelerator. And the detector is a lot of different things. They're very sophisticated, and there are eight or 10 different kinds of detectors all at work at the same time. But the basic idea is that the antiproton you're interested in is colliding with, uh, with atoms in some medium, whether it's a liquid or a solid, and it's ionizing them. It's breaking them up and freeing some electrons, which then get detected. So in other words, a measurement is just another kind of physical interaction. In fact, it's just a physics. 
It's a series of interactions in physics, and therefore it has a description directly in terms of rule one. And when you describe it directly in terms of rule one, the superposition principle comes into play, and if there are eight different ways that the antiproton could go through the detector, the wave representing its probability flows through all of those waves. But in fact, I use the word probability, but this rule doesn't know anything about probability. It's just the wave flows all the possible ways it can flow. So if you believe rule one's description of the measurement interaction, there are all possible outcomes. The antiproton could exit the detector in any of a large number of different directions. Rule two says, no, there's one outcome. I can't tell you which one it is. I can tell you the probability to find it as a result of running some algorithm on the quantum state, which is analogous to taking the square of the height of the wave. So rule one says every possible outcome occurs in some sense. Rule two says there's just one kind, there's just one outcome, and it's picked out with some probability rule. So that seems to me to contradict each other. Is there one outcome or are there all outcomes? Certainly, there's a problem. Now, at this point, a lot of philosophers get involved and different kinds of physicists get involved, and they come up with, of course, because even very well-educated people, if there's only two or three strategies available, come up always with the same strategy. The strategy is get rid of the second rule. Second rule sounds crazy. This is fundamental physics, and it's going to talk about probabilities for an outcome. Why don't we derive the second rule from the first rule by making a very sophisticated description of what's going on in the measuring instrument and derive where those probabilities come from? And that's called the measurement problem the desire to get rid of these two rules which refer explicitly to experiment and have just one rule. And as long as it's unsolved, then quantum mechanics has the concept of a measurement in its fundamental rules, and it's not realism. It's not compatible with realism. And that's called the measurement problem. Now, there are some people who believe the measurement problem is not really a problem, and it's over-exaggerated, and it's a bunch of people who are past their prime and should be retired who have been worrying about this forever. But I've been worrying about this since I was 17, and I'm not supposed to go past that. <laughs> but I think if you're an honest scientist, you have to say, quantum mechanics works, but it works to predict the probabilities of the outcomes in a situation where the existence of a single outcome is nearly incompatible with, what, with its basic other law. These two laws are in quite a lot of tension with each other, and that is the measurement problem. Now, of course, Bohr had a lot to say about how co things are complementary and in tension all the time, and you always have to have two or more incompatible viewpoints at the same time to understand anything. And that especially goes true for knowledge and truth and beauty. And, and he got it all from the Kabbalah, of course. But anyway, it doesn't cut it with me. I don't, I think people who try to defend the present situation are defending some, are holding up progress because there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is to break through and understand quantum physics for real, and not in terms of this weird two-rule game. That's just my opinion. Now, Schrodinger's cat is another way of saying what the problem is. You have an atom which is radioactive. It decays. That gets connected to an amplifier, which sends a spark into the ears of a cat, poor thing. <laughs> and if the, uh, the atom is in some quantum state, which is a superposition of having decayed and having not yet decayed, 
If it has not yet decayed, the cat is alive. And if it has decayed, there's been a spark that went down the wire and the cat is in heaven. Which is it? The box has a lid, and before you open the box, rule one says that the cat is in a superposition of states being alive and dead. Now we open the box and look at it, and maybe you watch me do this, and maybe I go into a superposition of having seen the alive cat who is with the atom which is not yet decayed, and another state in which I've seen the dead cat, and I'm with the dead cat and the atom that has decayed. And then my friend Nancy comes in and asks me how I'm doing, and she goes into a state which is a superposition of be, being worried about me or knowing better and, <laughs> and so on. This is just Schrodinger's fanciful way of putting the problem, because Schrodinger was a realist, and he was worried about this. So there are many different ways to say this, but the bottom line is that what we imagine is possible if we could get beyond this paralysis is a detailed description of what goes on in, in every individual atomic, molecular, or nuclear process. And it doesn't give us that description, it just gives us these two rules. And we keep going back and forth between waves and particles and so forth. It's even worse than that. We have all an intuitive idea of what a probability is. It comes from averaging over many instances. And in most of science, when we talk about probabilities, that's well understood, at least until you talk to the philosophers of probability. Um, in terms of averaging over many repetitions of the same situation or experiment. But in quantum mechanics, there's no such story. There's no such story that the probabilities that quantum mechanics talks about are come from averaging over many different situations. They're just there. Now, some people think that's good, but we'll come to them later. <laughs> But you get the, uh, this is, I'm just in different ways making the argument, which I warned you in advance is not the most popular argument at this point in time, that there is a problem and we should be finding out this better theory, this deeper theory behind quantum mechanics. Now, here's the big clue. If you come this far with me, here's what I think is the big clue. And it's, I told you there were three principles about quantum mechanics, and this is the third. It's called entanglement. And it comes along with a property called non-locality. And now I'm going to explain these to you. Let's consider that we have two particles, A and B, and we put them in some quantum state. Now, I told you the first principle is that if we consider them as one system, we can have a state that describes half the information that we might imagine we need about them. But here's an interesting thing we can do in quantum mechanics. We can put them in a state where we know everything precisely about some relationship between them and nothing at all about them individually. And this is called an entangled state. And an example is the contrary state, I call it. It's actually known as the Bell state and some other technical things, but we're going to call it the contrary state, in which you pick some property, say the position of the momentum of particle A and particle B, and you measure them both. And whatever is the result for particle A, the opposite will be the result for particle B. So if the property is momentum, if particle A is going that way with some momentum, particle B is going that way with some momentum. If the property is whether you like dogs or cats, if particle A likes dogs, then particle B will like cats, and so on. It's true for all the properties that you might be sensibly thinking about. So that's the property called entanglement. And entanglement, very beautifully, it was a consequence of the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. But it wasn't understood right away. It wasn't understood in the 1920s. 
The first hint of understanding it came from a paper in 1935 by Einstein, which was one of his attempts to say, hey, whoa, guys, your theory doesn't make any sense, or at best, it's incomplete. And I'm going to tell you the argument that he and his two young colleagues presented to coming to the conclusion that quantum mechanics was incomplete. And it made use of this quantum state contrary. Many years later, this property of entangled states became understood to be not just beautiful, but useful. And there is a whole world of development of quantum technology based on using these entangled states to compute, to encrypt, and to many other things. This is what quantum computation, quantum information is all about. But that's not what my talk is about. But it's interesting that this wasn't understood for many years. And even Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen got it wrong. So I think I already said this. Here's what Einstein and his two young collaborators argued. They gave a criteria for reality, because they were realists. So they, and the people said to them, OK, what do you mean when you say something is real? You're driving me crazy. What do you mean the electron position should be real? If we can't see it directly, what do you mean? And so Einstein and his friends said, well, I'll tell you what we mean. Imagine you have some system, I'm going to call it B, and there's a property that you're going to measure. And you can predict, not with some probability, but with certainty what the outcome of that measurement is going to be. So let me repeat that. You can predict with certainty, with probability one, what the outcome of that measurement is going to be. Then there's an element of physical reality corresponding to that measurement you're going to make. In other words, because you have a way of knowing with certainty what the outcome is, there must be something really real about that property at that time in that particle. OK? So that's the criteria they gave for reality. And here's the arg I'm going to run the argument. Apply this to an entangled pair in the state contrary, which is contrary in momentum and position. And measure the momentum, we'll start with the momentum, of the other particle. So in other words, you make this pair of particles. They could be photons or atoms, or it doesn't really matter. And particle B is way over there, and we're over here with particle A. And we're going to measure the momentum of particle A. We haven't disturbed particle B. We've just measured particle A. Particle B is way over in Chicago or Rome or somewhere. But we know for sure that if we measure the momentum of particle B, we'll get minus P, minus the momentum we got for A. That satisfies Einstein's and friend's criteria. So therefore, the momentum of particle B is an aspect of physical reality. OK, you following me? But I could do that to the position as well. Now, I can't measure the position and the momentum both of particle A, because the uncertainty principle tells me that that will just give random answers. But I, instead of acting to measure the momentum of particle A, I'm going to measure its position. Doesn't matter, because we're not touching particle B. So when it doesn't, particle B doesn't know or care what we choose to measure on particle A. So if I choose instead to measure the position of particle A, it'll be some number. And the particle B will have the opposite position, which means that there was some origin around which its position could be reflected, which is where the pair came from. So therefore, the position of particle B is also an element of physical reality. Clever, these guys. Same Einstein. But in either case, we don't disturb particle B. Hence, particle B's momentum and position are both part of physical reality. But the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics says that quantum mechanics cannot tell you what both of them are. 
Therefore, that particle B has properties that quantum mechanics cannot describe. Therefore, quantum mechanics is incomplete. OK? Niels Bohr came back a few weeks later with a paper in which he says, it's not a matter of actually disturbing particle B. It's a matter of disturbing the very context in which the measurements of particle B have meaning. And on and on like that for six pages of the physical review. Do you see the argument? Now, experts aren't allowed. There's a flaw in the argument. There actually is a flaw. I love the argument. I love the conclusion. But there is a flaw. Does anybody? Well, this is the fulcrum on which the whole story rests. The hidden assumption is what it means to be able to disturb particle B. Because I said five different ways. It's way over there. Therefore, what we do over here acting on particle A can affect particle B. And that assumption is that physics is local. That if I want to affect particle B, I got to go all the way over here and do something to it. I got to be next to it. In other words, you can only disturb a system if you're nearby it, interacting directly with it. Or you can send a pulse of a laser beam, but the laser Light travels over there and knocks it. So this is a hidden assumption that Einstein and everybody else at the time made. We call it locality. Now, John Bell, I'm telling this story all out of order, but John Bell was an Irish particle physicist who most of his life worked on conventional particle physics but at some point was very inspired by something which is coming up. So I'm out of historical order. In 1964, John Bell found a way to test the assumption of locality. In other words, not to be a philosopher and argue, is it true, is it not true, from what principles. But he found a way to test experimentally a close related assumption to this idea of locality. And the assumption that he found a way to test was consider a situation like that with two particles, A and B, far from each other. And we're going to measure one property of each. One property that we're going to choose a particle A and one property we're going to choose a particle B. And we're going to assume that you cannot affect the value of the property X that we choose to measure at B by the choice of what property we're going to measure at particle A. That's reasonable. If particle B way over there has some property that we're eventually going to measure, we're not measuring it now, it can't be affected by not even the outcome, but just the choice of what I choose to measure over here on the other particle. So that assumption is called Bell locality. And he was clever. And it turns out that with almost no other assumptions, you can derive a mathematical inequality between the probabilities for different measurements on the two particles to be correlated with each other. And I'm not going to say more about it. It's just you measure some things over here, and you measure some things over here, and you take statistics that discuss correlations. And there's a certain function of those correlations that has to be less than 2. No other, basically no other assumptions. And that's called the Bell inequality. And this was 1964. Now, Bell saw immediately that quantum mechanics itself violated his inequality, which it had to, because otherwise Einstein's argument would succeed. If Bell's locality is true, then Einstein's argument is correct, and then quantum mechanics is incomplete. So if you were a believer in the completeness of quantum mechanics, and all of these Copenhagen people not only believed that quantum mechanics was true now, they wrote books and papers about how it would always be the case. There was nothing other logically possible. We were stuck with this theory of quantum mechanics. 
And that implied that Bell had to be wrong. And Bell's inequality did disagree with quantum mechanics. But it turned out that you could experimentally test it on pairs of photons. You could have a, an, an atom, a chlorine, or I forget what they used, but the cesium, some atom, which decayed to produce two photons in this state where there are the correlations, as I've described them, the oppositional state. And by measuring correlations between the polarizations of these two photons, they could test Bell's inequality. Now, when I was started graduate school, where I was in graduate school, somebody had done their PhD thesis on doing this, and he had found that Bell's inequality was satisfied. No, I have it wrong. Was, is if Bell's inequality is satisfied, then his assumption of locality is right. That's right. So he got, from the quantum mechanics point of view, the wrong answer. And all the professors in the department tried to fix the device. Nobody could fix the device. They gave him his PhD, and they <laughs> sent him on his way. <laughs> his name was John Clauser. Was, on his way turned out to be Berkeley. But Alain Aspect in Paris and his collaborators were the first people to do the experiment correctly, and they found that Bell's inequality was massively violated. And this experiment has been done many, many times, many different ways, and Bell's assumption is disproved experimentally. Hence, you can affect the value of property X of particle B by what you choose to measure on particle A. That's experimentally demonstrated, and let that sink in. Not just in quantum physics, but it's been, the experiment has been done with, no, with barely any other assumptions. And believe me, there's been many years of fighting over little counter examples and little holes in the argument. And almost every way of finding a loophole in the argument has been tr tested and patched up, up by now. This is just true. Hence, Quantum mechanics covers this up by giving you only statistical predictions. You see, quantum mechanics doesn't tell you how it is that what you measure on particle A affects particle B, because it all just comes out in the statistics correctly. But if you want the complete theory I'm arguing for, and that Einstein was arguing for, which gives a detailed description of how it is that this influence is conveyed, you're going to have to have explicitly non-local physics, physics in which you do something to a particle here. And if that particle is, has been in a contrary state with another particle, it affects that other particle. And so the idea of making completion of quantum mechanics means that we have to mess with the concept of space and what's near and what's far. Now, I'm going to slowly, I'm not going to slowly stop. I'm going to basically stop there. As I said, many of the inventors of quantum mechanics were anti-realists. There has been realist formulations of quantum mechanics. So the next chapter of the story is in response to the situation there were people who went out and invented other versions of quantum physics which did not depend on measurement and which were realist and are realist. And this is a lively area of research, and I hope I've motivated you to be interested in. But I think this is a good time to stop and ask for questions and discussion. you were here for three or four hours, and I went on to <laughs> explain these theories. But I think we should stop, and let's have some questions and discussions. And
So in the theater, if you want, the microphone is here. You can uh, form a line and make some questions. And uh, otherwise, we can start with an online question or two. And I have to get my glasses. I'm learning. So let's start with this. Do you think humans can truly understand the universe? Who yes. says the universe must be comp comprehensible by us humans? Online question. I think the honest answer is I don't know, but I'm game to try. <laughs> that is, my job as a scientist is not to get to the ultimate end. I don't think we're near the end of the development of physics. Somebody asked me that in an interview on Monday. I think we have a long way to go. There are many things that we don't understand about nature and the universe. And our job here in this building and elsewhere physics is done is to go the next step. And I hope I've convinced you that the next step should involve a replacement of quantum mechanics by a deeper, more complete theory. But I'm not responsible for ultimate. Is there an ultimate end? Will we reach a point where we don't understand anything? It already feels like that 90% of the time in our professional work. <laughs> so I, I don't think I need to, be, to answer that question. Thank you. Let's go in theater. Hi. Uh, what do you make of the idea of the multiverse, in which case all possible outcomes can exist simultaneously? They just exist in different universes. The book devotes two chapters to this idea of the multi, the multi well, there, let's be clear, of what's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's, what's called the multiverse is actually something else, which says that there are many universes like ours, and that's not the, uh, the idea in quantum mechanics. There is an interpretation of quantum mechanics in which all outcomes happen, but our consciousness somehow splits every time there is a choice of different outcomes so that the universe appears to split into many different versions as time goes on. This, there are a lot of professional physicists and philosophers of physics who think this is an interesting, important idea. There is a big, and some of them people that I respect, there's a group of philosophers in Oxford who are good friends, many of them, and people I deeply respect who have spent decades thinking about this proposal. I think, personally, it's crazy, but out of, res out of respect for them, I, I, I tried in the book to explain the issue. So the issue is with probability, and, and I really already said it. Given just rule one, which has no probabilities, in which with probability one, every outcome occurs, how do you get from there to the probability in one situation with a definite outcome was 27% that the particle exists just out that door? And there's a long history going back to the 1950s of attempts to, to derive the probabilities from the version of the theory without probabilities. And at this point, all I can tell you, because it's a long discussion to set up, we even had a seminar just two days ago here with somebody presenting a new idea about this, is that the jury is out. All the ideas proposed to do this up to about 10 years ago have been shown to be flawed, and there are new ideas that people are trying, and as long as they're trying, the jury is out. But unless they can fix that, the theory is nonsense. Thanks. In the theater. Would it be possible that light would have a constant speed because it's interacting with a quantum force like the strong force? So the, let me understand the question. You're making it a question. Why does light have a constant speed? Why does it have the same speed in all reference frames? And that, remember what I said about principles? That's one of the principles of special relativity. Therefore, it's unexplained. It's something which Einstein 
assumed and which we assume and which leads to consequences which agree with experiment. Now you're asked, you're, so you're not satisfied with that and you're looking for an explanation. And you're looking for an explanation in terms of the strong nuclear force and interaction with it. And I'm just going to tell you the challenge that you face to formulate your question is to find a way to ask it, that is to develop a picture of an interaction between photons and hadrons through the strong nuclear force that doesn't assume special relativity but is in agreement with experiment. So that's your task, to formulate your question in a way that it could be testable. And let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, given that uh, you said locality is dead and I can, I can affect a particle over here and it affects a particle way over there, does that imply some sort of speed of light violation? The ex so first of all, let me be precise. Locality in the sense I defined it as Bell lo locality, asking that particular question about when you have two particles which are entangled in the contrary state et cetera, is dead. The assumption that the laws of the elementary particles obey special relativity and they live in a world where things have to propagate at the speed of light or less holds up dramatically well. And every time they turn on CERN or any other accelerator and they regularly deal with particles going near the speed of light, every calculation that an astrophysicist does confirms locality in that other sense. So it's a puzzle. Now, could you experimentally see if what I'm saying is true, could you experimentally see information or correlations travel faster than light? It's possible and there are formulations of realistic quantum systems in which ordinary quantum states, there's a sense of ordinary quantum states, do not allow you to see information traveling faster than light because they agree with standard quantum mechanics and standard systems. But there are ways to imagine non-standard states of these theories which are not states of quantum mechanics, which would allow such information transfer or propagation faster than light. And there are people working on observational tests. One of them is named Anthony Valentini, hypothesizing that maybe in the very early universe there were such effects. There are good limits on them on our present universe, but maybe in the very early universe there were more states around which were unusual in this sense. So it's possible and it's under study, but it's very constrained. Thank you. Let's see if we can get two more questions in. So um, I'm trying to wrap my head around this idea that quantum mechanics is wrong um, and how you can um, state that definitively. Because we've uh, clearly, as, as you mentioned, have experimented with the theory of quantum mechanics and establish correct results. Um, and just because there are elements we can't explain um, doesn't mean that the rest of, that doesn't mean that the elements aren't there. So I don't know how you can call it wrong with, just because there's a lack of information rather than a conclusive proof that it is not correct. Well, then I can, with Einstein and with other people, re retreat back to incomplete. But let me give you a historical fable. As it happens, a complete version of quantum mechanics was presented by Louis de Broglie in 1927 at a famous conference in Brussels, which is the first time that all the different quantum physicists met and presented their theories to each other. His theory was rejected for reasons that are very puzzling. 
But supposing there had been a different history where all the young students flocked to Paris to work with Louis de Broglie rather than to Copenhagen to work with Niels Bohr. And Louis de Broglie's theory was developed. And then the history would read, the right version of quantum mechanics was invented in 1927 by Louis de Broglie and has been developed since. And because of that, we had the standard model in 1940 and we had quantum gravity in 1955 and so forth because having the right quantum mechanics, things happen much quicker. And there's this funny thing in the textbooks where there are these crazy people who eventually went on to become artists and actors named Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, who presented these crazy ideas about particles and molecules not being real. But that was wrong, and therefore they did not have good careers and good lives in science, so they went on to comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a version of history which is compatible with all the facts on the table. That is the puzzle I give to you is why didn't people develop Louis de Broglie's theory in 1927? And there's a lot of things in the book. I, there are a lot of interesting sides, lights, that sort. Let me just mention one. There was one reason, allegedly, is that a great mathematician proved a theorem that said that no alternatives to quantum mechanics were possible. And there was one person who understood almost immediately that von Neumann's theorem was fallacious. And she was Betty Herman. And she didn't get a job in physics. Her paper was published. She didn't have a career. And nobody paid any attention to her paper and to her puncturing the balloon of the impossibility of a theory like de Broglie's, which was already on the table for several years. And one of the things that historians should ask is what would have happened to the history of physics had that paper been taken seriously. As it was, it wasn't until the 1960s that it became clear that that paper was fallacious. And so research went down a different track than it might have. And so I'm not proposing anything insane. I'm not proposing. And even though I tell my story as a kind of comedy, Niels Bohr was a great scientist and a great mentor. Werner Heisenberg was a great scientist, as were Pauli and many, many of the other people who flocked to work with him. There were good reasons to celebrate their success. But the theory is still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I insist on that. If, you'd, if you don't let me say that, then you're not going to let me say that Ptolemy's theory was wrong. Ptolemy's theory gave three-place accuracy over several hundred year time scales for the positions of the planets, the moons, the moon, Maybe there are moons, who knows? <laughs> the moon, et cetera, on the sky. Yet we're very comfortable saying that Ptolemy's theory was completely wrong. But for a thousand years, it gave three point accuracy. So if I get to call that theory wrong, then I get to hypothesize that Ptolemy's theory <laughs> is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get that one last question in. Here we go. Um, so often advancements in thought are often made when deep-rooted assumptions are challenged, like locality. Do you think our problem with quantum mechanics is that we are basing it on some incorrect assumption? And if so, any, any guesses on what that might be? Well, most people who work with quantum mechanics don't have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> So, although, let's, again, the situation, we like to present black and white things and comedies, and the situation is much more interesting and much more complicated. Richard Feynman was a very pragmatic physicist. 
He didn't work on the problems of foundations of quantum mechanics. He didn't think they were worthy of the results that he could get working on other problems in physics. But he did say many times when he was asked that he was sure that nobody understood quantum mechanics. He couldn't, he didn't know what the problem was, but he knew there was a problem. And I've known many people in my career who were uncomfortable with quantum mechanics, put the discomfort aside, found things to work on where you can make progress. And I did the same thing. As I said, I've been worrying about this since I was 17, but I did not specialize in it. And the reason I did not specialize in it is I didn't have the impression that you could make progress with it. Because I made that decision a little, a few years before all the experiments testing Bell's inequality started up. And I made the wrong decision from a certain point of view. Because the whole field of quantum technology and quantum information and quantum computing grew out of taking these problems from quantum mechanics seriously. I just think we should continue to take them seriously. And we, so we'll see. The point about science, and I've made this point many different ways in many different contexts, is that we do research because we don't know the answer. And we trust that we're part of a community that acts rationally enough that in the future they will be able to choose the work that increased our explanatory range over the work that didn't increase our explanatory range. Because that's, and here I'm with David Deutsch and I'm quoting him. The progress of science is all about increasing the number of things that we can explain. And it's an open competition. With, among professionals, we have different hypotheses, and we trust that there's an ethics in the profession strong enough that in 100 years, people will have made the right choices about which hypotheses were right and which were not. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lee Smolens.